guys, it's me again from Sinclair Jewelry. I thought I would just take a few minutes to talk about one of my favorite pieces of jewelry, pieces, which is this. And, yeah, it's simple, interesting ring, and uh, it actually pretty much sums up one of the reasons I love doing what I do. I was like, and this, there it is. If you look at it, it's kind of... It's different. Mm, yeah, interesting. Well, that was actually inspired by a very specific piece in this book. If you like jewelry, you like history, buy it. Just, just do it. Probably one of my favorite reference books ever, and I'm sitting here at my design desk surrounded, and this is one I reach for the most. But yeah, there it is. That ring. That ring, let's see, give you some details here, the exact details. Silver, early Latene finger ring, 3rd century BC. Now, that one was found in Britain. It was the only one ever found in Britain. Normally these are found, you know, Scandinavia, Sweden, you know, that the Viking-y part is where they're found. The silver wasn't a big thing in Britain at the time. So, that ring was probably used for trade. And I remember just looking at that and reading that little, because it's in a book full of, you know, beautiful, remarkable pieces of jewelry. Now, it's, it's rather plain, but it just, it just fascinated me because I wondered, well, why is it bent into a U? Why isn't it a normal ring? Uh, you know what? Yeah, why, why did this end up in Britain? How does it feel? Because it doesn't look like it would feel very good. All the research I've done, you know, on that particular style of ring, and there's not much, uh, they're common, you know, over in the Viking parts of Europe. They're very common. And, you know, no matter how hard I looked, I could always find pictures of them that looked like what was in that book. You know, it's just the ring in the museum case, or just, you know, sitting with a little number next to it. It's like, oh, it's another one of those Latene rings. That's it. I could never find a picture of actually in situ, like in the grave. And I was wondering, oh, what, what, again, what's the purpose of this? Is there a reason for this? Is there simply this, just a design choice on the part of the ancient jeweler? And I thought it might be a bow ring because uh, archers would typically have a ring that would go around your thumb and would have a little pointy bit. And they use that to catch the bowstring, but oh, this, it's like, no, no. And they're made of silver, and that would bend with the force of the bow, so it's not a bow ring. And the more I looked at it, I thought, well, there's only one way I'm going to know how it's going to feel. And I am a jeweler, so I, I made it. Uh, now at that time, at the time, I was convinced it was a bow ring, which is a very interesting design. And like, and they found them all, and they found quite a lot of these things everywhere. You know, where in that part of the world. So I thought, oh, that must be an archer's ring. But I was like, that's okay. And then I was thinking, no, that, no, that, that doesn't. The force isn't right. And I, so I made it large so it would fit on my thumb. And I remember thinking, well, if it's not that, then why, why? And I went to put it on this finger, and at, you know, at the time, of course, it was too big. So, it was very much a, like, oh, crap, it doesn't fit. It was like, oh, it doesn't fit, I'll have to make a new one. Wait, no, I don't. Bend, bend, bendy, bend, bend. Ah, I get it. This is sort of... Now, infinitely resizable, obviously, but a very resizable ring. And as a test, I actually handed this to Brian. I was like, Brian, here, you try this on. See if this fits you. He's like, you know, it was just on my hand. He's like, no, it's not gonna... You know, he just, he bendy bend, bendy bendy, you know, pulls it apart, puts it on, and you squeeze it a little bit, and he's like, huh, no, it fits. I'm like, that is probably why they did it. They probably 
made these rings with the bends so they could be resizable, and that would explain why it ended up in Britain. It was probably used for trade. These rings like this could have been sort of, you know, they didn't have really money you know, at the time. Well, they did, but not everywhere had money and really recognized money. But a ring? Oh yeah, you could, you know, I'll give you those, I'll give you this for those, those bear furs over there. You know, I want one bear, one big old bear pelt for this. And trade him, and like, all right, fine. And he'd just take it from you, and he'd bend it so it fits his own finger, and off he goes. And I, I would imagine if I made more, and I made them all roughly the same size, they would stack quite nicely. So it'd be a very easy way to carry your wealth on you. I mean, there are necklace styles that were known as money chains, because the links, uh, typically a loop-in-loop -loop sort of style, the links could be easily taken out there carefully from one end, and you just put your hook back through the other two links. Actually, they're sort of shaped like this now that I think about it. Could just be a logical progression from that. But, you know, the links are that small for the necklace, so maybe this would be like a larger... This is a larger amount of silver, so it would be like, hey, it's like, I want those belts. I'm not going to give you my whole necklace, but I can give you my ring. That'd be cool. Yeah, so... Who knows? I mean, I, I never would have come to those conclusions. I never would have thought those things or had those sort of questions if I hadn't physically made this. And that's one of the reasons I love doing what I do. I, I love making historical jewelry because you look at it and you wonder, what did that feel like on? I mean, yeah, it was ceremonial, but how long were the ceremonies? I mean, you know, some of these crowns you see, they were huge. And, oh, God, they must be so heavy. Like, how long did you have to sit there, not move, with that thing on your head? Or was it actually comfortable? Was it nicely padded? I mean, yeah, it might have been heavy, but was it, did it fit well? Was it nicely padded? Um, you know, that's, these sorts of questions, I mean, you can wonder about them all you like, but if you just look at them in the museum box, or you just look at them in the book, I mean, you're not going to, you're not going to know. You don't know. You know, a lot, a lot of these, I don't even have an idea of scale. Like, how big is the buckle? I don't, I don't know how big the Sutton Hoo buckle is. I know, though, if I looked, I could find measurements. I could find measurements, and I could draw it out on my paper here at my desk. But... It wouldn't really tell, that would tell me something, but it really wouldn't tell me as much as it would if I were to actually make one. Now, granted, <laughs> Brian needs a few more cutting tools before he can cut me garnets like that. Yeah, that's not enamel. Those are cut stones. All those little things, those are all cut stones. So it'll be a little while before I can make a decent replica, but I always love that one. I always love that piece. But even the simple pieces can hold quite a lot. A lot of questions, a lot of wonder. And it kind of makes me think, where... That little ring dug up in Britain, where did it go? We know where it started, but from there, where did it go? We know where it ended up. But we don't know how many hands it saw, how many places. It's seen it just ended up in a burial mound in Britain, eventually. And being silver, and there not being lots of silver in Britain, it was very highly prized. Even though today, it's like, oh, it's just a silver ring. What's so special about it? 